Still getting uh, people joining. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just say that uh, those on the line so far, welcome to uh, the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Sciences new seminar series called Coastal and Marine Science and Management. This is our first effort to bring these new topics to ASU campus. Uh, not only is ASU in the desert, but it doesn't have a consolidated coastal marine science program yet. And that's one of the primary goals of our center is to bring that through new faculty hires, through new networks, and through new programs and uh, projects to bring that together, to make this a, a new realm for ASU and for ASU's um, collaborators. And so this seminar series is, a, uh, is an idea that Shauna Fu, Dr. Shauna Fu, who's going to introduce our speaker today, and I discussed, and she, uh, I'm really thankful that she's taken this on to help us uh, build up our, our, uh, our, area, our, our knowledge and our interest in this domain. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shauna to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Murray Ford. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Murray Ford, who is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Science at the University of Auckland. So Dr. Ford is a coastal geomorphologist with research focused on how coastal systems adjust to environmental change. He researches how coastal landforms, particularly low-lying reef islands in the Pacific, respond to processes such as storms and sea level rise. And he uses a mix of field and remote sensing approaches to investigate how these systems behave to better understand future responses to environmental change and the impacts of coastal hazards on local communities. So we will have time for questions at the end, if you could please hold them until then. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Murray Ford with his talk, Disappearing Islands, New Insights into the Future of Coral Reef Islands in the Pacific. Okay, thanks for that intro. Just make sure everyone uh, can see my screen fine. Is that maximized? It's all good. Okay, yeah, hi. Well, thanks for that intro. That was um, really good. I must um, remember that for next time I have to write one. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, as uh, Sean has said, my name is Murray Ford. I work here at the University of Auckland in the School of Environment, which is the kind of um, agglomeration of geography, um, both the human and physical, as well as earth science and uh, environmental science. And I work primarily on um, low-lying tropical uh, coral reef islands. So I tend to have my head above the water um, and, and working on the islands themselves rather than the, um, the coral reefs around them, which I uh, look at just for fun. So I did my PhD um, a decade or so ago, and I looked at sediment generation on coral reefs and in particular how the um, durability of the, the skeletons of the reef framework and the organisms living on the reef um, is, is expressed within the sediment. And then at some point um, you have a real, well, I have a realization that looking down a microscope um, at teaspoons of sand wasn't perhaps the scale I wanted to work at. And I took up a position as the first NOAA Sea Grant extension agent um, which was a, a University of Hawaii um, College of the Marshall Islands uh, position in Madro in the Marshall Islands. And while there I found um, more than one box, but several boxes of aerial photos, which I'll revisit later. Um, having gone a little, um, having spent three years in the Marshall Islands, I returned to the University of Auckland uh, to teach um, GIS and, and coastal science. So in this talk, I'm going to run through um, an introduction as to what reef islands actually are and talk about the problem of climate change and reef islands, and then uh, talk about uh, my work and, and others' work, I, I trying to kind of unpick the problem of, you know, what are these islands going to look like in the future, um, and, and a little bit about what that means for the uh, communities living on them, although in this talk, I tend to focus on the inhabited islands without all the uh, anthropogenic pressures that go with the uh, urban settings within these atoll nations. So reef islands are mid to late Holocene deposits of, um, of reef derived sediment. So they're geologically very young, um, you know, out to about 5,000 years old would be about the oldest low lying reef island that would be dated. Um, and, and through to kind of maybe a thousand years, even 
um, as I'll touch on uh, a bit later, some younger islands as well. And so what I, what's really attracted me to these islands is 100% composed of the skeletal remains of the reef framework. So the, the flourishing coral reef and the skeletons of the organisms which live on that coral reef. So some islands might be 70% forams, um, others will be more coral dominated. But it, yeah, in a, in a kind of thinking them in a conceptual model sort of framework, it's really nice to have really clearly defined boundaries and, and that kind of ecological connection to the uh, geomorphology of the islands. So, you know, schematically, this is basically how we get an island. We have um, a, a coral reef and the, the ecology of the reef and the different species residing on that. And then through a series of physical, chemical and biological processes, that, that reef framework and the organisms become the sediment to build an island. That sediment's kind of swept up by, by waves um, and, and forms a small deposit, which um, you know, expands. And ultimately we're left with some landform, uh, a low lying island whose elevation is kind of controlled by um, the sea level at the time of formation and the, the wave run up, how high up the beach can the waves mobilize sediment and, and deposit it onto the island surface. So quite nice, tidy little systems to kind of think about and to work with. And, you know, no, unlike the coast here in New Zealand and, and you know, California and elsewhere, no cliffs eroding, no rivers dumping sand into the system and, and things like that, quite uh, tidy systems to work within. And as you'd no doubt know, these low-lying reef islands or atoll islands are, uh, kind of the, the poster child of the, the continued effects of climate change and sea level rise. And um, where I lived, Marshall Islands, they, uh, for at least the last decade, have kind of held the, the baton for the low-lying islands. have had some um, incredibly good political leaders who have kind of really um, driven home the, the message about climate change and sea level rise on these islands. And so you'll see these um, really stark confronting photos um, and all sorts of uh, mainstream media um, coverage of, of climate change. This, these ones here on the um, capital of um, Madro, and these are graves which are slowly um, eroding into the sea. Um, and, and, you know, cynically, this is the first stop that the politicians would take every journalist on the uh, climate change tour of Madro, but a, a really confronting image um, to be hit with when you get off the plane and, and see um, these potential, uh, these impacts of, of um, coastal change. What I guess it's important to, um, for this talk, get, get across at the start is the majority of people who live on atolls, um, which is close to a million worldwide, million people worldwide, I think, uh, live within urban settings. Okay, so here we have Malé um, in, in the Maldives. Um, I think over 100,000 people live on uh, Malé Island and a couple of hundred thousand on the, uh, the atoll itself. And, and there, if you go to Malé, covered in skyscrapers um, and you know, kind of rapid urban development over the last several decades. If we move to the Pacific, um, we've got Ebay, Island, which sits on Kwajalein Atoll, one of the largest atolls in the world, next to a US military base, and you've got 12,000, 15,000 people living there. And, and likewise down here on uh, Basio on Tarawa Atoll in Kiribati. Now these are highly engineered landforms. Uh, a lot of these islands didn't exist you know, prior to World War II, or if they did exist, they were small and have been expanded over the decades with reclamation and things like that. So it's a really tricky kind of topic to work with in, in that we often, in, in my work, I, I prefer to deal with islands with minimal human impact to try and understand the kind of, and characterize the natural behavior of the islands. And unfortunately, a lot of that work then gets um, picked up by people, um, some with nefarious kind of motives and applied to these low-lying uh, urban islands. And I like to try and keep them separate I like to think that you know, these islands are on an engineered pathway and their kind of adaptation future exists on those pathways. Whereas the kind of postcard islands 
um, uh, are the kind of islands I work on. And I think um, the, the response of these islands to, to sea level rise is entirely different to the urban settings and, and where you've got that complex interplay of um, you know, culture and economies and, and things like that. So through all that, um, let me just say I prefer to work on these islands, um, which is hopefully understandable. So what we've been trying to get at for the last decade or so is kind of what does the future of reef islands look like? And, and underpinning this in my work have been kind of three key research kind of questions. Firstly, kind of from a, a geological perspective, what are the conditions under which islands formed? So um, when did islands form? What was sea level doing at the time of island formation? And I put that as, as number one, but I'll talk about that um, towards the end. Um, how have islands behaved over a period of known sea level rise? The Marshall Islands is a great place to do this work um, because we have a really good, robust record of sea level from there. Tide gauge first went in, I think, in 1945, 1946, and has been running continuously since. So we see a clear sea level rise trend with a potential acceleration over the last uh, couple of decades. And then third sort of question is how these islands will respond um, geomorphically to um, future sea level and, and accelerating sea level rise. So my first um, lot of work in this space has been kind of remotely sensed. And as I mentioned earlier on, I found a box of aerial photos. In fact, it was three boxes of aerial photos in a government um, office in the Marshall Islands. And I spent probably six months quietly scanning those whenever I had an opportunity. And so we've got um, a near nationwide collection of aerial photos from um, between World War II and the 1970s, back when um, the Marshall Islands were a US uh, territory. And then we have a, a really good high resolution record um, from maybe 2004 to 2006 through to present day. And that, that record is um, high res satellite imagery, Worldview 2 and Quick Bird and the like. And actually, um, thank you to the US taxpayers for that because um, that's collected by the US Department of Agriculture. And you guys are really good at sharing, um, uh, sharing data in the US. And, and so, um, yeah, thanks for propping up my career for the last 10 years with your free uh, satellite imagery. And so the Marshall Islands, um, where we're going to talk about the remote sensing work, comprises of 29 atolls, which are the kind of circular, or well, they're not really circular, but the, uh, the ring of coral uh, enclosing a lagoon. And then they also have five, what we call mid-ocean platform islands. Now these are um, islands which lack a, a central lagoon. And because of the focusing of the waves on those platforms, those islands can often be higher by maybe a meter uh, than the uh, other atoll islands. Marshall Islands has stopped calling itself a small island um, state and started calling itself a large ocean state because they have over 2 million square kilometers of, of EEZ. And it's grouped with the, the Maldives, Tuvalu, Kiribati as the um, atoll nations you know, where the majority of the populations live on atoll islands. Within the Marshall Islands, the majority of the population live on two urban centers, uh, Madro and Kwajalein, um, Kwajalein next to the military base and, and Madro, the political and economic kind of capital, where probably about 30,000 uh, people live on maybe about nine square kilometers of land. Marshall Islands has a really stark difference between the urban and the, the unpopulated islands. Uh, unpopulated islands uh, tend to reflect kind of more natural conditions, obviously, and the urban has been an ad hoc collection of shoreline armoring and reclamation and island building um, since um, the kind of World War II days. That's where they started, uh, at least on Madro, started connecting islands with causeways um, and, and expanding islands, building runways and, and things like that. So back in 2010, um, a, a guy in Fiji called Arthur Webb um, and a, a um, professor here, Paul Kench, published a paper um, which examined maybe a handful of islands, 25 islands throughout the Pacific and found that there was no erosion over um, a period from the, the 1970s to about 2010. Now that kind of within this field started a bit of a gold rush. 
everyone was scrambling through archives, museums, libraries, government offices, trying to find old aerial photos of atoll islands to, to kind of see what the heck's happening here. Uh, Webb and Kench said that these islands haven't eroded. Um, everything we hear is that these islands are eroding. So what's going on? Um, so the Marshall Islands really quite fortunate in that uh, there was a really rich collection of aerial photos. Um, there's close to a thousand islands in the, in the Marshalls and we have aerial photos for almost all of them of which we've probably processed 600 now um, of, those, of those islands. It's really quite interesting. Well, yeah, interesting. They, they were photogra heavily photographed during World War II because they were Japanese um, base and, and, and the like. And it actually, as the war progressed, the quality of the photos improved. Yeah, at the end of the war, the Americans were flying so low that the detail on the aerial photos is incredible. So the, the aerial photos are better than um, kind of most of the present day imagery that we use. And so looking across the Marshall Islands, we see no evidence of widespread chronic erosion. So across those 500 plus islands, we'd probably see roughly 20% showing erosion, probably 40% showing accretion and, and probably 40% or so showing no significant change. This is quite a, a surprising uh, finding and um, some really interesting things to try and pick apart out of that is, you know, there will be some atolls where, you know, most islands are eroding and there'll be some atolls where every island is um, accreting despite being in the same sea level setting generally the same wave climate and, and, and it, all things else largely being equal. There's some really interesting things going on that we haven't quite resolved as yet. But in general, the trend there is for um, stability and accretion of islands over that kind of World War II to present day time frame. So the predominant mode of change has been accretion. Um, what we see is this considerable variability between atolls and between islands within um, the same atoll. So yeah, here are some examples. These are the kind of um, spits of, of some islands on um, Watje Atoll. And you know, you'll have two islands next to each other. One will have lost uh, maybe 50 meters of, of the spit while the other is accreted. There's probably no exchange in terms of sediment between those islands because they're a bit too far apart. But um, there's really no kind of coherent behavior that we've um, really detected at this point, except for that, yeah, when you look at a national scale, that increase in, in land area and, and due to accretion. In, in places, these changes have been pronounced. We see some really funky things going on with some islands where we'll see two islands weld together um, and then quickly kind of agglomerate. And you know, if you look at it on Google Earth, you won't even know that that used to be two islands. Um, so in, in some places we've seen uh, entirely new islands form. If we zoom out from the Marshall Islands and look at the global scale, a couple of years ago, um, French geographer Virginia um, Duvat published a, a paper where she reviewed all of this work that's taken place over the last decade, um, 700 plus islands. I suspect if she was to do this again now, it'd be closer to 1200 islands and found that across the Pacific, 88, 89% uh, of islands were stable or increasing in size. Um, pretty tricky piece of work to review because um, yeah, as it's still in its early days, there's been no systematic approach to measuring change. Um, so it's been a, a, it's a real mixed bag when you start tunneling through the studies as to how people have gone about measuring change, but um, she had a good crack at it. And in general, that, you know, what we see in the Marshall Islands is um, flowed through throughout the Pacific. Uh, some really good points from this review where there's no systematic approach to measuring change and, and no one had yet kind of clocked um, the, the problem of attribution. So to date, you know, we've done a, the, the community's done a really good job at describing change um, outside of human activity and a couple of bits of work looking at storms. It's pretty hard to say, this is what the shoreline's doing, this is how the island's behaving, and this is what's driving it. And, and that's kind of, I expect, what the next decade in this uh, field is going to try and get to is attributing a change to a process. Um, and, and hopefully that's where we take it because that's when um, it probably becomes a little bit more useful.
we uh, have tried to have a, a, a crack at looking at this in a systematic way on a global scale. This is some really, um, this is some really fun work that a student of mine did um, a year or so ago, and we're just hopefully about to push it over the line into a paper in the next uh, few weeks. And um, the student was looking for a, a project to, to learn how to use Google Earth Engine, kind of cloud computing platform for processing satellite imagery. And um, if you look at um, where that platform's contributing to it's these global scale assessments of, you could almost template it, a global scale assessment of urban land use change, of surface water, of mangroves, of um, now hopefully in this case, atoll land area. And um, basically in, into too many details, uh, created cloud-free landsat uh, composites of most atolls with islands in the world. Um, discarded ones where um, there's some patchy imagery and some with just insane levels of cloud cover, but ultimately landed on about 200 plus of the world's 400 atolls and did a, a supervised classification of all of these composites from the year 2000 through the present day. Um, various you know, land cover classes, vegetation, um, urban, um, all that. Um, but the ultimate aim was to try and collapse that into really simple land versus not land um, classification, a, a binary approach where we could track land uh, through time. And so here are some of the more interesting um, examples of where we've seen uh, kind of massive land use change. This figure's probably a bit hard to uh, interpret, but you see those islands in the South China Sea um, where there's been uh, military bases built. So I think that'd be panel D and I here um, would be in the South China Sea. Um, and then um, Male in the Maldives, where they've expanded their runway, they've built massive amounts of land to sustain their population and, and things like that. And then throughout kind of the, the less modified islands, we see, um, you know, like we see here in panel O and T. And, and the classification worked really well. It's not surprising. Um, the difference between land and water and remote sensing is quite stark. So um, it was uh, quite a, an accurate classification. And then when looked at across the, the world, we see that the majority of atolls over this time period show only minor changes. Now we're dealing with 30 meter imagery here. So we're not gonna get those fine scale changes, um, but we don't see any evidence of widespread erosion, just like in that review um, of the global studies. What we do see that's really interesting is that on a handful of atolls, island building is just orders of magnitude greater than any natural um, fluctuation in, in island land area. And we see that taking place in the Maldives where we've had um, 36, 37 square kilometers of land added um, since the year 2000. For perspective, that's almost two Tuvalu's, so Tuvalu, uh, a small atoll nation in the Pacific, I think it's about 20 square kilometers of land. Um, the Maldives in a handful of years have, have managed to almost add two Tuvalu's. Uh, South China Sea, Spratly Islands, all those other islands there, they've um, added close to 16 square kilometers of land. And then as you see, the, the rest of the main uh, countries which have atolls, is probably within, um, uh, you could probably attribute it to noise in the, in the um, analytical approach. So basically a handful of atolls are dominating the global land area change. North Male, almost over nine kilometers of square kilometers of land added and so on. But the bulk of atolls, very little land use uh, area change. So I mentioned before that one of the key challenges here is trying to get to the, the attribution problem. Now that's easy in um, the South China Sea and in the Maldives, we built or man, uh, humans built the islands, uh, military purposes or political agendas and various other things. Um, but in these unpopulated islands, can we start to get a handle as to what's driving change? Now, one of the, um, one of the attempts at this is to try and link storm activity as a, as a driver of, of island growth. Here is a, a 1945, I think, aerial photo of Jello Atoll in the Marshall Islands. And you'll notice here, there are three islands. 
And then if you come back, there are now two islands. And what we see there is this process that we've seen in, in a handful of places, five to six places around the Pacific, where if two islands get too close together, the channel tends to eventually get blocked. And then you see rapid infilling um, of that channel and then rapid colonization um, from coastal vegetation. And, and looking at this now on, on Google Earth, you wouldn't even know that there was a, another island there. How long that, you know, how, how many times that's happened over the last, you know, thousand years is really a bit of a mystery. Um, but it, it's a, a process that we think in this case was driven by a storm. Um, and um, we think that in, in some places, huge uh, geomorphic change has taken place as a result of storm activity. So we're talking about, depending on which part of the Pacific you're in, typhoons or, or cyclones. Um, generally, a low occurrence of um, typhoons in most atoll settings. So you don't see any in Tuvalu, um, less in, in Kiribati. Um, they tend to form in the Marshall Islands, and then there's a few more in the northwest of the country, um, near Inuitak and, and in the kind of northwest. Um, and, and then a, a much higher occurrence in, in the Western Pacific. Uh, the atolls of Micronesia, Federated States of Micronesia, get a lot more, at, uh, lot more typhoons than uh, elsewhere in the Pacific. Um, but within the Marshall Islands itself, there's been a, a handful of storms which have hit in the last 100 years, and these have had um, a really significant impact. One of those atolls that were hit was uh, the, uh, the easternmost and among the southernmost atolls in the Marshalls. Uh, it's close, very close to the equator, only uh, six degrees north of the equator, so it should really be largely out of the storm belt, but does get the odd one, obviously. Uh, 1905, a typhoon struck and <clears throat> killed nearly the entire population on the atoll. Um, there's quite good records from this time because there was some German traders nearby who um, recorded some of the impacts. Um, and there were reports of basically the islands fully being washed off uh, the reef. This is just kind of devegetated and the, the sand remained or whether it's just entirely washed off, we don't really know. Um, but we, we do have good records from 1945 through the present day. And what we, what we see is we're able to track the recovery from about 40 years after the storm through to 2010. And what we've seen is a, a huge uh, increase in, in land area on this atoll, where it increased from 73, 74 hectares in 1945 uh, and continues to increase um, and it's close to 91 hectares um, in, in 2010. And we see all sorts of uh, really interesting island behavior there where we've seen islands form, we've seen islands weld and extend and all sorts of um, strange behavior from these islands. And if you visit, um, well, this is about 10 kilometers north, uh, you'll see these massive um, chunks of reef that were thrown up probably by this storm and also by some previous storms. So it's obviously the, the power of these um, of this typhoon to you know, do geomorphic work was quite extreme. You know, size of a, um, a small school bus, you'll see these massive boulders over 200 meters from the edge of the reef. So obviously a really energetic event. And so what we see as we track the impact of that storm, these islands are exceptionally mobile and dynamic changing shape and position on the reef. Uh, one here, um, if you see my cursor, um, yeah, if you visited that island today, it is you know, bigger than a football field, uh, has a tree with a canopy over um, 12 meters in diameter. It looks like an island that's been there for a very long time. But back in 1945, it was a small gravel um, bank um, sitting on the reef. So storms clearly have a role in generating massive amounts of sediment and, and driving geomorphic change, which is similar to what we see here on, on Jello Atoll, where we were fortunate to have aerial photos both before and after the storm. And this was because it was the Japanese capital during uh, their control of, of the Marshall Islands and was hit by a storm in 1958 um, and then immediately visited by a couple of um, American teams um, out to, to look at the impacts of that storm on the vegetation and, and the local population and things like that. So there's a lot of study. There was a couple of papers in Nature 
1959 and 1961. So I thought they had an obligation to publish a third, but they didn't. Um, but so we, we've done a bit of work here on, on Jelloet. Similar uh, story to on the Dick Dick, we see islands totally destroyed, washed away, islands split in two, islands erode. And then tracking that through time, we see this recovery of the islands where we see the islands merge back together. We see islands uh, accrete and extend along the reef. Uh, we see considerable spit extension and all sorts of uh, behaviors of these islands to the point now where there is um, more land on Jello Atoll now than there was before the storm. Okay, so it was initially a, a large reduction in land area, about half a square kilometer. Um, but that recovery has um, been so great that it's actually built uh, more land than was there in the past. And, and um, having visited Jello maybe five years ago, there's still a lot of sediment within that system that's um, making its way um, to the island. And that's all that storm persists, you know, over 60 years after the event. Um, likewise, I suspect in the Dick Dick, where the storm was in uh, 1905, that sediment still, uh, that storm is still having an impact on the islands today, which makes it really hard when you look at an island under present day conditions and, and yeah, it could have been a storm 150 years ago that's currently responsible for how that shoreline's behaving, which makes it really difficult to, to try and understand what's going on. So obviously that was a, a huge input of sediment. And I think that's the, the key role of um, storms from an island perspective they're instantaneously causing erosion, but they're also setting in place the process to rebuild the island. So the, the reef is um, destroyed by the storm. Um, by all accounts, the, the reef flat is covered in debris afterwards. It smells uh, terrible from, from what I've heard. And then you end up with, you know, if you look at this beach here on, on Jello, it's low gradient. It's chocker full of sediment um, and, and that material is going to work its way um, through onto the islands as we'll talk about soon. And so we've done some work to try and understand and generate a, a chronology of storms um, in these settings to try and see is this a one in 300, one in 500 year event, um, what does that mean for the islands? Finally, well not finally, but uh, talk about these islands over a geological time frame, kind of coming back to it. There's a really nice idea. In fact, I think he might have been an ASU person, uh, William Dickinson. Um, I think he was from Arizona somewhere. Proposed this theory of the, the crossover theory um, as to a future date at which islands will be remobilized by future sea level. And so he looked at the sea level at which islands formed and uh, came up with this idea that once sea level exceeds, as it's increasing now, as it exceeds the sea level at the time of island formation, the islands will be remobilized, and that's when we'll start to see the massive impacts of, of sea level rise. And so um, I won't read this word for word, but um, in bold, rising global sea level will impact atoll environments um, once ambient high tide level rises above the mid-Holocene mid low tide level. Bit of a mouthful, but basically once sea level exceeds a threshold at which the islands formed uh, in the past. So this implies um, firstly that islands formed um, at, a, at a higher sea level um, and, and largely formed as sea level fell over the um, later part of the, after the mid-Holocene high stand. So we tried to, uh, to kind of test this idea. And we visited one of these mid-ocean platform islands it's called Jabot, about half a square kilometer in size, no central lagoon. And this is actually, by reef island standards, quite high, um, maybe up to three, four, five meters high in places. And that's really important. And from, a, from an adaptation perspective, you know, this island is two meters higher than an island 10 kilometers away. So um, they're not all the same, I guess would be the key point there. This is one of the oldest islands of this type found in the Pacific. I think the oldest date, uh, oldest radiocarbon date from this island is about 4,800 years um, before present. And so we saw this island clearly formed uh, a long time ago, probably at the, the height of the, um, the high stand um, within the area. We don't have a great Holocene sea level record um, from the central Pacific, but there was a high stand and 
uh, we think this island form sometime either leading up to or around that high stand. Okay, so we've got an island, four or 5,000 years old, um, and, and most records of island formation show that these islands are at least kind of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years old. And earlier I showed you a picture of an island on uh, Nadictic that um, looks, this is it here and zoomed in, you know, every single or nearly every single radiocarbon date published from a reef island is over a thousand years old, at least over 500 years old. Yet if you visited this island and you looked at it in 1945, there was no island there. So to me, there's some kind of um, disconnect between these geological studies, which show um, island formation taking place you know, a thousand plus years ago and the remote sensing work, which is showing this you know, massive recent growth of these islands. So if we're seeing this growth of islands, why aren't we seeing that within the geological record? You know, why aren't we seeing a whole bunch of modern radiocarbon dates published from um, atoll islands? I don't know. Um, and the next slide might help us um, pick that. So if we go 17 kilometers south of, of um, Jabot Island, we come to Eiling Lap Lap Atoll, uh, absolutely stunning um, atoll, um, a really, really nice place. And uh, interesting, you know, the islands here, this in the inset there, J, is a good meter, two meters lower in elevation than, um, than Jabot. And the, I'm on a tangent now, but, you know, clearly their future is going to be entirely different to Jabot's. You know, sea level rises, uh, Jabot might have, you know, the, the impacts of future sea level rise might manifest decades later than they would here on J. In fact, um, Susan Owen uh, from Simon Fraser has a paper looking at that showing that J would be inundated almost entirely um, with half a meter of sea level rise, whereas Jabot can accommodate much more. Um, anyway, so we have really good aerial photos from, from J and this kind of blew my mind when I first saw them. And so the, the end here of J actually in 1943 consisted of um, at least two islands, but you can see clearly that process of island welding has taken place with um, the other creatively named islands uh, and a whole bunch of channels here, which have infilled. And, um, and now if you visit there at present day, it looks like one uh, continuous island. It looks like those changes have been going on prior to World War II. Um, series of islands sequentially welded together um, with the, the channels and embayments and filling. So we managed to visit uh, Jay and collect a bunch of samples, um, dig a bunch of trenches, radiocarbon date material. And what we're able to see is that um, that island is expanding through the um, incorporation of modern sediment. And, and it seems kind of logical, um, but prior to this, we hadn't really seen the reef under present day conditions contributing sediment that builds an island under present, you know, at the present time. And so to me, this kind of helped, um, and maybe it's a one-off snapshot case study type thing, but it really helps to show that, um, you know, these islands aren't relics, they're um, active under present day conditions, still receiving sediment from the reef uh, and still expanding under, under present day. So yeah, the island's building westward. Uh, we can see that through satellite imagery and, and we can see it continuing to expand. Um, so um, the eastern part of the island, don't wanna get bogged down in this, but the eastern part of the island might be one to, uh, one to 2000 years old, whereas the western end is younger and we're seeing modern material contribute to the continued evolution of this island. Um, which just shows so many things, but to me it shows that uh, a healthy, and this seems like a really uh, flourishing healthy reef, is able to produce enough sediment, um, you know, a relatively small area to, to, to kind of um, initiate such massive landform change. Okay, so what does that all mean? Um, from a geological perspective, look at these islands, it shows that we have at Jabot dates that um, kind of straddle the increase in sea level up to the high stand, through the high stand. Then in J, we have dates which um, there's some suggestion there was a kind of pause in sea level uh, fall in the Marshall Islands, it's still a bit tenuous. Um, then definitely a fall in Western J. And then as sea level continues, as now rising for the last 
hundred years or more, we're still seeing island formation possible under all sorts of different sea level uh, conditions, which is uh, kind of a points to the, the current state being more contingent on sediment generation, which is reliant on the ecology of the reef than sea level at, under present conditions, whether that continues into the future as sea level, sea level rise might swamp the contribution of, of sediment supply uh, into the future. We don't know that yet. Okay, so as I kind of think more to how these islands will look in the future, there's been a lot of work over the last decade looking at, um, by, by near-shore oceanographers, looking at how waves behave on coral reefs. Okay, and so you'll see a bunch of studies, models, observations, looking at how a wave transforms from deep water across breaking on the edge of the reef and then transforms across the reef flat. A lot of physics type stuff going on there. Uh, and so they're focused on resolving the behavior of waves as they go from deep water to the island shorelines. And then they stop. They tend not to then pay much attention to the islands themselves. They're content to, to reach the toe of the island beach and, and call it a day there. But that's led to um, a bunch of people now starting to think about how the islands themselves will respond to wave overtopping. So, you know, people are interested from hazard perspective, from a physics perspective, um, and now from a geomorphic perspective, what these waves uh, might do to the islands themselves. So this led to some quite cool work by a, a PhD student of mine. Um, she finished last year, so she must have done this two or three years ago. We're essentially, um, should tell you it was much more complicated, but she built islands in a wave tank. She built islands in a bathtub, basically. And this is really cool. She built this kind of six, eight meter long island based on uh, the scaling of a real island, took it um, as far from New Zealand as you can get to Plymouth in the UK, where they have a, a facility testing ships and things like that, and threw these waves at it and all the scaling and things like that. And so she could see how the island changed under different conditions. And so and she did a couple of tanks, one, the exciting big tank, and then two, a, a little bloom, which doesn't look like much, but actually yielded some really interesting findings. So she built this one to 50 scale model of this island in Tuvalu. And um, it's really a rabbit hole to go down to do flume work. I can see why you know, it's, it's complicated, but the scaling issue, she used sand, which scales to gravel and, and things like that. Um, and she increased sea level by half a meter and a meter and threw some storm waves at the island to see how it will change shape through time. And so what she saw was there's this overwash and rollover process which promotes a lagoonward migration of the island. Kind of makes sense, similar to what you see on barrier islands on the east coast of the US, um, that overwash and rollover process. Um, interestingly, um, and we and under bigger waves, you'd see more migration and under um, higher sea level, you'd see more and, and things like that. So the island got narrower with less volume above water level. Um, but we found or she found that the, the crest elevation increases um, and in some cases under large wave conditions outpaced sea level rise. Um, this particular set of experiments is very conservative because the reef stayed the same and there was no sediment being produced. So this is probably a conservative outlook for the island to march very rapidly across uh, losing volume as it goes. Um, now what's going on, what's going on here? This is a complicated figure from one of her papers, but basically we saw a whole bunch, bunch of scenarios, some in which the island crest on the ocean side was able to um, keep pace or exceed um, the uh, amount of sea level thrown at it. And uh, she also ran a bunch of experiments which aren't yet published, but should be soon, where she added sediment to the system as well. Okay, so she simulated the effect of a storm um, and, and what might happen and, and looked at how the island responded differently. So the island, um, not to ruin the upcoming surprise in the next few months, but the island, um, uh, was more robust when all that additional sediment was added to the system as you'd expect. Just two or three days ago, um, someone, uh, a guy called Hurt Masselink at University of Plymouth, um, he's taken this from the flume to a computer model, a numeric uh, wave sediment model, um, along with um, some researchers, Kurt Stellazzi at USGS, 
and some others um, here in New Zealand and Canada and run a whole bunch of numeric models um, and, and seen similar results, seeing that um, the height of the island is controlled um, by the maximum uprush from the swash, the waves impacting the beach, how far up the beach they run. So this literally came out in the last uh, day or two. From a remote sensing perspective, which is where I'm slightly more interested in, this is a, it's a bit hard to interpret this image, but this is a um, Worldview 2 image of an atoll in um, Federated States of Micronesia that was hit by a typhoon in 2000, February 2019. And this is the, the runway um, along here. And you can see all the sand deposited onto the island surface. So you can, you know, as distrustful of models as you want to be, um, you can't, um, or, which I often, but um, you can't, with the remote sensing observations, you can see huge layers of sand deposited all over the island surface. Not great if you um, own the airport or run the airport or um, terrible if you, uh, the local village, but this process of sediment coming from that flourishing reef onto the beach and onto the island surface is really key uh, to how these islands respond into the future. Okay, so what does this all mean? Our treatment of islands as inert static landforms is really too simplistic as we think about it into the future. They're dynamic, changing shape, size, and position on the reef platform. These processes provide a slightly more optimistic outlook for unmodified islands than the simple drown in place kind of model. And that's what we've been sitting on for um, decades is the simple model where the islands are in a bathtub, we've turned on the tap and they slowly um, drown or erode in place. It's much more complicated. The ecological and geomorphic you know, interaction is really interesting and kind of what drives it. Um, the majority of people though live on urban settings within these atoll nations and their adaptation future, you know, the trajectory of these islands is clearly, you know, you can't sit back and, and, and hope these geomorphic processes are gonna, um, you know, protect you into the future because these urban settings are armored with seawalls and the like. The reef is really stressed through pollution, through dredging and things like that. Um, so these islands are clearly unable to exhibit the same geomorphic response. This is where our work gets um, us into a little bit of trouble when, um, you know, I've had um, climate change denying politicians from Australia, um, you know, wave our work around saying, oh, look, the islands are fine. We don't need to help them. Uh, and that's clearly not the case. Um, but these urban settings need to yeah, there's some lessons from the natural unmodified islands, um, but they'll need to continue to adopt an engineering trajectory for their kind of adaptation into the future. Still really large gaps in this in this area around how island groundwater will um, be changed, you know, freshwater um, groundwater, and how the vegetation will respond to future sea level rise and wave overwash. So those, those processes haven't been tackled yet. Uh, and, and how future changes uh, to reef health might impact sediment generation and, and the flow and effects of geomorphology. So if your reef turns from a, a really nice healthy reef to a, a slimy algal assemblage, um, it's clearly not gonna be producing all that uh, really useful sediment. And what does that then mean for the islands? How long does it take for that change to kind of manifest? Anyway, that's, that's it for me. Uh, happy to take any questions on that. Well, thanks for that, Murray. That was really interesting. So we do have time for questions and um, maybe to help prevent people talking over one another, if you could please use the Zoom uh, panel to raise your hand and I will call on you to ask your question. Okay, Greg, I see your hand up. <laughs> if you wanted to <laughs> ask. I was, like, I was like playing Jeopardy. I wanted to click first. Murray, that was outstanding. Just such a great presentation, I learned a lot. My, my question is, this is such a dynamic area of research. How fast is it making in it, how fast is your knowledge and findings making it into the IPCC impact arena, the reports, that process? I haven't read the fine print in the IPCC on, that, on these issues. Um, the previous one, it, there was some, some mention, um, I don't know what the, the current one's under review now, I think. Um, so yeah, I don't, don't actually know. It, it's probably on, I mean, the science community that's working on this probably hasn't done the greatest job 
at translating this into useful, um, either useful data or um, contributing it to like adaptation plans and things like that. So it's it's still, I think, is a real gulf between what we've been doing and what people are doing on the ground on the islands. Um, so it does it does make itself through into the IPCC stuff. Yeah. Uh, not to put you on the spot, but J oh, JD, good. Yep, you, you put your hand back up <laughs> if you if your question. Yeah, quick question. Great talk again. Thank you. Um, so the question is, um, uh, you mentioned remote sensing quite a bit. I was thinking broadly around what else do we need to measure to understand what I'll just call like shoreline dynamics kind of in some sense. So, um, uh, and my question is on kind of bathymetry, subduction, subsidence, how do these things change in bathymetry? How much do they affect as well the island? Uh, yeah, I guess those, yeah, any, um, uh, those are processes which are probably occurring over longer time frames. So what's really important is the, the elevation of the reef relative to sea level, because that controls how much wave energy reaches the island. Um, the kind of, from a tectonic perspective, the relative land motion, these are central plate islands, there, there's very little. Um, Sorry, and you, did you mention topography as well? I can't remember. Um, yeah, like especially like in sense of, a sense of tidal changes. I suppose that's quite sensitive to local bathymetry and that's also changing, but I don't know if it directly connects with particularly atolls as opposed to, yeah, I was just thinking kind of aloud uh, if it has a major effect. Yeah, not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I, it's tide, tide stuff's not really my thing, but um, yeah, the Australians, uh, at least through a lot of the Pacific have, have put in continuous GPS sites next to tide gauges. And um, so there's really good records from at least a few of these atolls. Got it. But yeah, in short, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, no, this helps. Yeah, just thinking aloud. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Nick Vaughan, did you have your question? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I'm not entirely sure what my question is here. I'm going to try to say it out as I'm talking. Um, as a kind of forest ecologist looking at trees having a natural kind of distribution of growing and, and dying, uh, I kind of see these islands as having possibly the same kind of stable natural distribution um, under normal conditions. Has, any, has anyone looked at kind of how common it is for islands to kind of wash away suddenly or if, um, like the accretion and decrease of uh, sudden decreases are kind of balanced in any way? Not, not really. Like it still hasn't been looked at systematically. Like I, I still, whenever there's a, a storm through the Pacific, I'll try and get the most recent imagery and things like that, but there's still no systematic approach to look at these islands, which is, which is woeful um, given, you know, the, tension and given the severity of what's happening there's no systematic monitoring of, of reef islands and there the the ability to do that now exists you know as you see with the reef monitoring and deforestation and everything else there's no systematic monitoring of these islands so we don't know um we don't know there's still a lot of yeah the vegetation uh you plot ndvi of one of these islands um before and after a storm event, you'll see you know, the, the greening, the, well, the browning of the vegetation, and then the recovery over a year or two, but there's still, no one's looking at it kind of systematically. It's all piecemeal. Cool. Um, Jiwei, did you have your question? Yeah, yeah, that's a great talk. Thank you so much. So I have a question. When you do your research in Marshall Island, you mentioned there's an unpopulated island and some like people living in the, in the island. Do you see the island change in this type of different island? Like the what level of the human driver factors to the island change? Do you have an idea about that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess like from a populated island perspective, I, I see two kind of classes of island. There's the, the Madra and the Ibai with you know, thousands of people per square kilometer. And then there's the remote island, which might have a village of 40 or 50 people. Uh, clearly, I think those remote islands are the ones where the conflict between these, the natural geomorphic process and the, the desire of that, um, um, 
engineering and adaptation, that's where that's going to manifest because on the, the urban islands, they're going to, once you're on the engineering pathway, you can't get off it. You know, I lived there for three years and you'd see well-meaning adaptation people come and say, oh, we'll, we'll plant mangroves to protect the coast, which is great, but mangroves don't grow there on the coast. Um, and also you've got a hospital, a school, you've got 35,000 people. Um, you've been on a 70 year engineering pathway. You're gonna to have to continue that. Um, you can do it in smarter ways, obviously. Coastal engineers are doing really interesting things. Uh, whereas in the outer islands on those remote communities, that's where they're kind of into like learning from nature and nature-based solutions and things like that probably come into play. And, and they don't really have the capacity to greatly modify their islands in those settings because they don't have either the need or the equipment and money and resource to do that. There's 40 people, um, maybe 100 people on a larger village. They just don't have that um, capability really. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, I might end it there. I don't see any other questions or hand raised. Um, but if you do, if you didn't get to ask a question, please email me. I can forward it on to Murray and bug you there. But um, thanks again. Thanks, Murray. That was really great. Thanks for kicking off our seminar series. And um, please join us again next month. So the 25th of February, again at 12 p.m. Um, for the next seminar, which will be from Dr. Jonathan Whitney from NOAA, which will talk about the survival and transport of larval fishes. So, thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Murray. Outstanding.